Hello and welcome. I'm Scott Postma, president of Kepler Education. In this video, I want to answer the question, what is a classical Christian education? In a nutshell, classical Christian education stands in the historic tradition of the liberal arts with an aim toward human flourishing. It further stands in opposition to the modern progressivist pedagogy and the Slavish agenda of job training. Though classical education itself has been mildly dynamic over the years, it has been a stable tradition lasting in its approach for more than two millennia of the Western civilization. And at Kepler, we take the position that a truly classical Christian education strives to glean the best of Western liberal education in every epoch. So, without further ado, I'd like to answer the question by highlighting seven characteristics of a classical Christian education. The first characteristic is the development and cultivation of a biblical worldview sometimes called paideia, and you can see Ephesians 6.4 for this. While the word worldview brings its own set of baggage to the conversation, I use it here to mean thinking Christianly about the world in which we live and move and have our being. A student with a biblical worldview possesses a comprehensive vision of the cosmos as having been created by God and still being redeemed by God as well as a moral imagination informed by the truth of Scripture. Later, we will see that this Christian worldview falls into the stage of education called piety. Now, the second characteristic of a classical Christian education is its focus on a liberal or humane education. In opposition to the modern and slavish approach to training mere workers for an industrialized and crony capitalist society, Classical Christian education seeks to educate the whole person, human qua human. This is what liberal or libere in the liberal arts refers to. In a classical Christian education, it's the education of a liberated man or the education that makes for a full and free human being. Regarding education oriented to job training in a world where vocations ebb and flow like the tide, John Gardner rightly said, we must train our young people in the fundamental fields of knowledge and equip them to understand and cope with change. And to the point of educating the whole person, Robert Maynard Hutchins famously said, nobody can decide for himself whether he's going to be a human being. The only question open to him is whether he'll be an ignorant, undeveloped one or one who has sought to reach the highest point he is capable of. Of attaining. And that's what a liberal arts or classical Christian education aims to do. Now the third characteristic of a classical Christian education is a pedagogical method that follows the order of the seven medieval liberal arts, mainly as it relates to a child's development, but also as an approach to teaching all subject matter. These seven liberal arts are described by the medieval divines as the trivium, meaning three ways, and the quadrivium, meaning four ways. First, following the trivium, students learn grammar, or language, and then dialectic, meaning logical thinking, and finally rhetoric, the ability to express oneself accurately and persuasively, before moving on to study the quadrivium. The quadrivium treats four universal truths, number, geometry, harmony, and astronomy. Now, early in the modern renewal of classical Christian education, those seeking to recover this model relied heavily on an essay by Dorothy Sayers titled The Lost Tools of Learning. I highly recommend it. It was an extremely helpful essay and many schools adopted her pedagogical model, but the recovery didn't stop there. In the midst of repairing the ruins, more about classical pedagogy was uncovered. Sayers' essay, uh, where it's just the tip of the iceberg, if you'll allow me to use a worn-out metaphor. It revealed how important poetic knowledge was to the whole formation of the person. And today, we can recognize a much fuller expression of classical Christian education, sometimes referred to as the PG-MAPT paradigm. That means piety, gymnasium, music, liberal arts, philosophy, and theology, where the A there stands for the liberal arts tradition. And this education is bookended by poetic knowledge and modern consummate studies. 
The fourth characteristic recognizes pedagogical approach must be applied to something. In other words, classical Christian education is more than just pedagogy. It's a pedagogy applied to a specific pool of knowledge. The best of what has been thought and written in the last two and a half millennia of the Western tradition. Now, sometimes this pool or canon of knowledge is referred to as the great books. And when referring to great books, we don't necessarily mean Mortimer Adler's 60 volume set. His is merely a collection of the kinds of works to which I refer. And by the way, it is a fairly good collection, though uh, it is somewhat incomplete. Now, classical Christian education makes a point of exposing students to these primary sources in an integrated fashion, finding in both the classical and the uh, Christian traditions that all truth, that is reality, is one. In other words, knowledge of any subject is only a partial knowledge of the one truth. And instead of studying textbooks of disintegrated subjects like social studies and history and English, classical Christian education seeks to train the student in the humanities in an integrated manner. This means they read and discuss in Socratic fashion the best primary literature, philosophy, theology, and historical records for any given historical period. The fifth characteristic of a truly classical Christian education is the study of classical languages, including Greek and especially Latin. Now, there has been a few who have made a somewhat meritorious argument of substituting Latin with modern languages. But there are many stronger arguments for the continued inclusion of classical languages in a classical Christian education. Here's a few of those arguments that I think are worth considering. Learning Latin gives students the ability to read many of the important primary sources in their native Latin, as well as texts not yet translated into English. Secondly, learning Latin provides students with a fuller understanding of the English language since about 40% of English is derived from Latin. And many of the professional vocations still do and probably always will rely heavily on Latin languages, consider law and science and medicine and theology. And one ancillary and pragmatic reason is the students who study Latin overwhelmingly score higher on standardized tests than students who have not studied Latin. In any case, classical Christian education emphasizes learning not only modern languages, but the classical languages as a fundamental staple of a human being's education. Now on to the sixth characteristic. The sixth characteristic is teaching students with the goal of fostering virtue and wisdom instead of helping them accumulate mere disconnected facts. While modern education takes what it claims to be a secular approach, it's because they wrongly believe education can only consist of the is and not the ought where classical education emphasizes what a student ought to be by highlighting what maybe David Hicks and his norms and nobility called the tyranny of the ideal image. This ideal image is exemplified by the seven Christian virtues, prudence, fortitude, wisdom, justice, faith, hope, and love, and is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. See Ephesians 4 for this. Now finally, the seventh characteristic of a truly classical Christian education has already been alluded to in relation to at least two other characteristics, namely in that students read primary sources and classical languages are essential. But it would be remiss not to emphasize the fact that classical Christian education is language-focused learning rather than image-focused learning. This doesn't mean that classical education discludes the plastic arts like painting and sculpting. Quite the contrary. It simply means that it emphasizes language-based learning. In other words, classical Christian education emphasizes learning through words, written and spoken, rather than through videos or other types of imaging. This short excerpt from Dorothy Sayer's essay, Lost Tools of Learning, is apropos as much to the entire enterprise of recovering classical Christian education in a world dominated by pixels as it is to this seventh characteristic. So I'll leave you with this quote. She says, by teaching them all to read, we have left them at the mercy of the printed word. By the invention of the film and the radio, we have made certain that no aversion to reading shall secure them from the incessant battery of words, 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 
They do not know what the words mean. They do not know how to ward them off or blunt their edge or fling them back. They are a prey to words and their emotions instead of being masters of them in their intellects. We who were scandalized in 1940 when men were sent to fight armored tanks with rifles are not scandalized when young men and women are sent into the world to fight mass propaganda with a smattering of subjects. And when whole classes and whole nations become hypnotized by the arts of the spellbinder, we have the impudence to be astonished. We dole out lip service to the importance of education, lip service and just occasionally a little grant of money. We postpone the school, leaving age and plan to build bigger and better schools. The teachers slave conscientiously in and out of school hours. And yet, as I believe, all this devoted effort is largely frustrated because we have lost the tools of learning and in their absence can only make a botched and piecemeal job of it. Thank you for listening and God bless you.